bring salvation bring your kingdom let all that you have made bring glory to your name when we fall you are the savior when we call god you are the answer there is power such power there I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me. Where the wrath I deserve, it is gone, it has passed, your blood has hid me. Mercy. Mercy, as endless as the sea, I'll sing your will lift up the cup and the bread we will break remembering your love we were fallen from grace but you took on our shame and nailed it to a cross thank God mercy Mercy, as endless as the sea, I'll sing your hallelujah for all eternity. Mercy. the same I'll sing your hallelujah for all eternity
will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross where mercy paid for me. Mercy! Mercy paid for us! I'm excited today what the Holy Spirit has put on our heart for you because it's so spotlights Jesus. Give me my title today. So simple. And I want to talk about my favorite topic. I want to talk about the Lord Jesus and I want to give you a, a, a little new twist on an old idea because everything we can say about Jesus is an old idea. We've been talking about Jesus in Christianity for two millennium now, but how do we make that fresh? And that's always the daily challenge. And I found that the way that that happens is the more you see Jesus, the more amazingly the Holy Spirit reveals to you things that have always been there about Him. You'll never get a new revelation like nobody else has ever seen it, but it'll be new to you. And when that happens, it's like seeing something fresh about Christ all over again. So I title this today, The Preciousness of Jesus. As I thought about that title, I'll work my way into that. Because in reality, I want to show you where you're at first. And I want to do that differently than you might think. Because here's what strikes me. In the church, many times, in order to extenuate the preciousness of Jesus, whatever adjective we had put in front of it, the gentleness of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus, to do that, we find it necessary too many times in the pulpit to contrast how bad you are with how good He is. And that seems to be the only way we really know how to describe how beautiful, how gentle, how meek, how lovely, how precious. So we'll say things like this. Jesus is so gentle, and then we'll compare it to how rough people are. Jesus is so kind, and we'll compare it to how rude people are. Jesus is the giver of life, and we'll compare it to how murderous people are. It's almost as if the only way to make Jesus look good is to make God's creation look bad. I disagree. You are made in the likeness and in the image of God. God doesn't need to diss you in order to make Himself look good. And so the reality is not that the precious Jesus is so precious because you're so unprecious. It's actually the opposite. Jesus is so precious whenever you begin to see how precious you are in the eyes of the Father. And so I don't want to take you down the road today of comparing you to Jesus us to Jesus. I want rather to find out where we are at in the Father. And you're going to, you might be amazed to find it's the exact same place that the Son is at in the Father, that Jesus dwells in the Father. Also, one other little caveat before we dig into the Scriptures. The very fact that we use preciousness in the title, in, in most of our culture, it, it sort of speaks of something weak, almost as if it's um, an insult to, to the great God of creation, to use the adjective precious. And there's a connotation that seems to say that somehow this is going to be some sort of soft message on Jesus. And I think that's a shame if that's the way people feel, is every time you talk about the gentle Jesus, it's almost as if we have to counter that with, yes, but he's also rough. It's almost like every message I ever heard on the love of God had a but on the other side of it, but he's also holy. As if he couldn't be loving and holy at equal measure. He had to, they were two opposite ends of the coin. It was like holiness was one side and love was the other. But you had to preach both. Otherwise, you were preaching them out of balance. And the truth is, is that preciousness does not in any way take away from who God is. It just enhances who God is. It's not to remove his authority, his power. It's not to remove his... his uh, the awe and the fear and the trembling of who God is. It's just to show you another side. So I want to take you to the book of Titus where Paul writes to his friend. And I want to do something a little bit unusual for me, and that is I want to use Old King James today. And the reason why that I'm not going to use Old King James on every text, but on this opening text. And the reason why I want to use Old King James is not because the translation is so good. In fact, hold on to your hats, the translation is terrible. <laughs> The Old King James translation is, is not rendered from the oldest Greek text. It's rendered from the youngest Greek text, which means you're trying to figure out what someone 2,000 years ago wrote by using books that had been translated 50 times by the time you started working on them. That's the issue with the King James. However, most of us in this part of the world, what I call the, 
the, if, like I said last week, if not the buckle of the Bible belt, the first loop. <laughs> uh, most of us in this part of the world have, were raised on the King James. Why I bring that up is because we got used to, if you're like me, I got used to quoting verses using old King James words. Sometimes I don't even recognize Scripture if I don't see it first in the King James because I so familiarized myself with the terminology. And so I want to use it to show you a, a phrase that is very common in Christian vernacular, was mistranslated where it was originally, and I haven't even seen it translated, I don't think, quite like it should be in many of our translations today. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, starting in verse number 11. For grace people, this is a very, very popular passage, the 11th and 12th verse. Not often read out of the King James, but we'll do that. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The reason this verse is so popular, if you'll allow me to do this before we get, dig into the meat. One of the reasons this verse is so popular is because this is a verse that shows us grace is not a doctrine. Grace is a person and His name is Jesus. Grace has appeared that brings salvation to all men. And that man is Jesus. The next verse, verse 12, will show you what grace is going to do. Teaching us. What teaches us? Grace. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So the reason why we grace people love Titus 2, 11 and 12, is it's the verses that we use when someone says, if you don't teach people the Ten Commandments, how will they know how to live? We run over to Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 and say, grace has already appeared to all men, the same grace that brings salvation, and look what grace does. It teaches you how to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, how to live soberly, righteously in this present world. And it doesn't say anything about the law. Rather, it says everything about grace. So what we say out of these passages, and I think we're right, I, I believe we're right, is that the, what teaches a man to live in his righteousness is not outward performance, but the grace of God. Who, Not what, but who is the grace of God? Jesus. Okay? So... As we see Jesus, we actually see the pattern by which we are to live. We see how to deny ungodliness. We see how not to walk according to our worldly, fleshly lusts. We see how to live soberly. That's in our right mind. Paul said, we've been given not the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. We see how to concentrate on who He is, how to live, I, I hate the, the phrase, live within the boundaries, but the Holy Spirit designs those in our own heart. I just don't think they're universal that we get up and preach them as external boundaries, they're in your heart. And as the Holy Spirit puts them in your heart, you follow, you listen, whatever He says you do it, when He stops talking, you stop moving. Right? That's, that's grace living. And there are boundaries that are established by the Holy Spirit, but they're established. The more you see grace, the more this becomes internalized. That's what it teaches us. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Now that was all just the salad in front of the stake, because that's really not the text, just leading in. Because I, you notice there's a semicolon at the end of the verse. And I really want to work you into the passages that are coming up because I want to show you something that I think is pretty cool and a, a place where I want you to know where you're at in Christ. Let's go to 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Great thing to do. The, to look for the blessed hope and the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 14. Who gave himself for us, talking about Jesus. Notice the old King James doesn't capitalize. This is one of the things I do love about the new King James. The old King James doesn't capitalize those pronouns like himself. No capital H, though it's talking about Jesus. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Redeem is to buy back. He bought us back out of the slave market of iniquity. To buy us out of iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. How many of you believe that Jesus has redeemed you from the slave market of sin? Amen. How many of you believe that Jesus has purified you unto himself? Amen. I was setting you up because if you believe you've been bought out of the slave market of sin, you have to have been purified. So you are pure today. And everybody said... Amen. Don't believe the lie that you're impure, that you've got to go be pure. You've got to go get pure. You've got to go do things to be considered pure. If you've been purchased from the slave market of sin, he didn't lay down on the other half of the job. Buy you out of sin, forget to clean you up. And he also didn't buy you out of sin, then leave it up to you to clean you up. He bought you out of iniquity, 
and he purified unto himself a peculiar people. My first steps in the message of grace, my first journey, when he began to reveal to me his love was, Father, I've, I've heard all of this before. My problem has always been that I always went about my own works to bring out the purity that you're teaching me is mine. And I remember praying this. Father, if, you're, if I'm going to change into what I know you want me to be, you're going to have to purify me because I am sick and tired of trying to purify me. It never works. I can't figure out how to be pure in my own works. So you're going to have to do it or you're just going to have to live with me like I am. That was, that was my final give up prayer. I said, you're going to have to purify me or you're just going to have to take me like I am. I didn't realize I was, I was in his wheelhouse right there, man. He said, all I ever wanted to do was take you like you are. I'll do all the work. You just enjoy. Just see Jesus. I'll do all the purifying. You didn't buy you out of sin. He bought you out of sin. If he bought you out of sin, he purifies you. Mission accomplished. His work finished. Now, the reason we used King James is because I want that strange, peculiar word. Peculiar. He has purchased, he has purified unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And, and now all of us are zealous of good works. If, you, if you've been bought out of slavery, you're purified, you're seeing the grace of God at work in your life, man, you want to do good things. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at all the counter arguments against grace. People are going to sin like crazy and they're going to... I go, man, if you ever see Jesus, you'll, want, you'll be zealous for good works. And there's just no way around it. You'll just be zealous to be his kid, not to run around and see what you can get by with. You've been doing that your whole life anyway. I mean, what, 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 you didn't need the license of God to go around and see what you can get by with. It's the moment you receive the grace of God, you become zealous for good works because you are purchased, because you are pure. The more you know it, the more zealous you become for good works. But it's that odd word that King James uses there for peculiar. Because it just, in our language, it's weird. I don't mean the word's weird. I mean it means weird. If you, right? I mean, he, he purified for himself a weird people. That's how we would define that. And most of the time growing up in the church, I went, yeah, well, he's right. I mean, that's, I, mean I can't argue with that verse. <laughs> it's just a bunch of weirdos, man. And, and I saw some crazy weird stuff in the church by some people. I'm going to tell you we're weird with a capital W. All caps, in fact. They didn't shut the caps lock off after they got past the W. They just kept right on flying, weirdo. And, uh, and I was one of them at times. I know that. But we thought that was okay. In fact, we kind of thought that was Christianity at its deepest. That when you really dug in, got saved like you're supposed to, because there was always levels of saved. You know, some of you are saved, but some of you are saved like you're supposed to be saved. And... <laughs> Those of you who are saved like you're supposed to be, you're going to be a little bit weird to the world because, you know, you just ain't going to go along with their stuff. And you're not, going to, you're not going to do what they want you to do. And they're just going to look at you as odd. Well, you might be surprised to know, and you probably won't be, that this is just a pitiful translation when it comes to us understanding what God was really trying to say. What he's trying to say is way better than weird with all caps. In fact, it doesn't have anything to do with it at all. Look at the next screen. Let me show you this. Verse 14, the word peculiar, comes out in the King James Version from the Greek, periousios. Periousios is defined by Thayer's Greek lexicon, that which is one's own, belonging to one's possessions. Go back for a second with that definition in mind. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, or let's say it the way the Greek would say it, and Purify unto himself a people that he has purchased that belong to him that are his very own possession. It has anything to do with weird, but it has to do with I, I have bought you and nobody else owns you. The enemy doesn't own you. Sin doesn't own you. You don't even own you. I am yours. You are mine I have not only brought my grace to teach you how to live, I've brought my grace to show you what life really is because I've bought you into my family. I picked you. This is what it means to be elect. You hear the preaching about the elect? He elected you. He picked you and brought you into the family 
which is an awesome thing. You met Him with your faith. And when you met Him with your faith, you began to come alive into who He has made you. Now go back to my definition screen because you probably noticed that I have a compound at the end of the screen. Why I'm doing that is because, interestingly enough, periosios, as used in Titus 2, is never used again in the New Testament. Although the word peculiar is used again in the King James. So you read it and you go, well, it must be translated the same way every time. The reality is it's never put in this phrase in the Greek again in the New Testament. You can, you, you can prove me right or wrong on that by just doing a simple run of the Greek through your Strong's Concordance or your Thayer's Lexicon. What you'll find is this is the only time it shows up, periosis. And what that tells me is they particularly use this word on purpose. Though there are other words that get translated peculiar, he didn't use them. When Paul wrote this to Titus, he used the only one in the Greek that combines two compound words, both of one of which is defined in, I didn't bother to write them in Greek, but in the English, around and to be. And remember what we've talked about with compound words, very simple, like, and I always use baseball. Baseball, one word. It contains bases and it contains a ball. You put them together, you, you put a base out there, it's its own thing. You put a ball out there, you can play a bunch of different sports. But you put them together, you got one defined sport. Okay? You don't think about another sport when you hear them put together. It stops being about another kind of ball and it starts being a baseball. Okay? What you've done is you've taken two words that have independent meaning. You've put them together to have a corporate meeting. You can't really do that in the Greek with everything. You can't even do that in the English with everything. But you, can't, but you can get a start. And when you, when you Greek, when the translator, I'm sorry, when the writer uses a specific Greek word when he could have used another one, you have to at least consider the fact of why he did it. And in this case, it's very interesting because we get backup for this in the Greek. I know I'm getting a little deep for Sunday morning. Just hey, hold on for the ride, okay? Because I don't think we ought to always be shallow, sucking on bottles. Once in a while, you need to cut a steak, put it in your mouth, chomp down. All right? And so pre prepare yourself today because I think God's going to take you into a, an understanding about who you are in Christ and where you're at in the Father. That's going to bless your heart. So what we have, take the compound thought of periosis. Take the compound thought of around and to be or to be around. Think of it this way. Imagine yourself in the, in the center and then enclosed in a circle. If we were going to draw it, you could put a dot on the page and circle the dot. You're the dot. The circling is what God did when he purchased you as his own possession. It's periosis. What that is, is to be around. The to be is the same phrase used when Jesus in John 8 says, Before Abraham was, I am. He used the same word that's at the end of periosis. In other words, this is where I'm at. This is who I am. I, to be, I am. When Paul writes to Titus, you are peculiar people, he's saying you are surrounded by him. He has encircled you. He, he has placed you there and then drawn a protective fence around you. The idea is spherical, a circle. You don't see this word again. So it's hard to compare. It's hard to go, well, where did they use it elsewhere? Because they didn't use it elsewhere. But they use the heart of it. They use the theme of it. And wouldn't you know, it's Paul that uses the theme of it again. When Paul says this, in the next verse, 1 Thessalonians 1.1, 1, 1, and when you look at it, you, you don't see it. You just don't catch it in the English. You got to have the heartbeat of it in the Greek. Listen to the verse. You're not going to find anything peculiar. <laughs> That was a little pun there, peculiar. It's not a good one if you have to put your hand up and go, that was a little pun there. It's not, not effective. 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. <laughs> Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the verse because I love the greeting. I love the grace to you and peace. Uh, grace and peace. But that's not, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're looking for. What we are seeing here, we don't see it in the English, because in the English, you just got a bunch of words and a few prepositional phrases, a lot of in, in, God, in, in God, in Christ. But where we, where we miss it, where, we, where it's that, and we don't see it. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Greek phrasing set up is a sphere on the phrase in God, that God is spherical 
What I mean by that, that God is circular. And when the author uses the Greek syntax and puts you in God, see it? In God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God, in the Greek structure, he is saying you're in the circle of God. Where did he come up with that? Well, he's already he used it in Titus when he said, you are surrounded by, you are a peculiar people. You are in God's spherical. In other words, God surrounds you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says grace to you. So what Paul believed for God's people is what I believe for you. You are peculiar, not weird. You are around, he is surrounding you because he has purchased you. You're his purchased possession that he put inside of the circle. Now we use this phrase in business or in relation and we say, this guy is in the inner circle. What does it mean if you go to work tomorrow and they say, well, that guy right there is in the inner circle. You don't assume anything about circles on the floor. We know it's a metaphor, but what does it really mean? Well, it could mean that you're in the middle of the target. It might not be a great place to be, but I think it stretches back. I don't know if the true etymology is here, but I think it could stretch back to the Greek syntax of the language. That when you were in the circle, you were inside of a place you were placed. You were, you were spotted and then surrounded, not for a bad reason, but for protective reasons, so that you would know the heart of the one who surrounded you. So if you go to work tomorrow and they go, this guy's in the inner circle, you automatically, you don't assume it has anything to do with circles or targets. You think it means this guy is, is close to the boss, has an inside track, knows what's going on. Uh, share a heartbeat. What was something else? It's favored. Yeah. Yeah. By whom? By whoever drew the circle. Right? I mean, whoever drew the circle favors this guy. That's why they put him in the inner circle. And you go, well, I'm not in the inner. We'll say this, well, I'm not in the inner circle. What do you mean by that? Well, you mean, hopefully you don't mean I'm not favored because your favor comes through Christ, not through your boss, by the way. But you go, well, I'm not in the inner circle. What you mean by that is I don't, they don't consult me before they make these decisions. I'm not in the inner circle. I'm not inside. So what Paul's really done is place the believer in the inner circle of God's decision-making process, God's protective process, God's love process, which means you are in a position where you can know the heartbeat of God. One simple little intro to the Thessalonians. Yeah, that's, that's how deep and complex the Greek language is. Paul's reader would have seen it. We see in God. We just move on. Paul's reader would have seen we're in a circle. What am I doing in this circle? You've been brought in. God says you don't live on the outside anymore. You live on the inside. And then in Titus, he calls it periosis, or we call it peculiar. And a lot of times we got so messed up because it was just weirdo. You're not weird. You might be weird. <laughs> That's just between you and, you know. But in God's eyes, maybe you are weird. Jeff, he's weird. <laughs> Jennifer said amen, too. She was pointing. That's the only reason I asked. This one's weird. That's just in the natural realm. You might be weird. But listen, and also in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm, it has nothing to do with being odd. The stranger you are to sinners, the closer you are to God, that's silly. That's, that's, that's demonic. That's the enemy trying to get you to identify your position in Christ by how popular you are. I'm not very popular. I must be close to God. People don't want to hang out with me. It must be because I'm, go I'm growing in holiness. That's silly. That's the kind of garbage the enemy's been pumping into Christians for so long. And we buy it because we believe that we're supposed to be these outliers and we're supposed to be on the... And the reality is, is that you are in the inner circle of God Wherever Jesus is, you should be finding yourself somewhere inside of that circle. And, and Jesus took shots in his walk on earth because he ate with sinners and publicans and, and prostitutes. And 
why did he take shots? Because they didn't realize that what he was doing was pulling into the inner circle those who would simply believe, not those who lived right. I said this to you a few weeks ago. I'm going to keep repeating this. If, if doing the right thing makes you closer to God, Jesus' best friends should have been the scribes and Pharisees. Because they did the right thing all the time. Jesus even complimented them on it. Remember? He said, you're doing this and this. You ought not leave that undone. That's good. But you've forgotten the weightier measures of the law like love. He said, that's kind of a big one. And that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He goes, you, you guys are good at tithing and going to the temple, but you forgot to love people, sort of a big deal. And you, you got to get back to that. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's what Jesus says. That's what I'm trying to do is not ignore the other stuff, but extenuate what Paul would come along and say is a more excellent way. Charity, love. So what Jesus is doing is drawing them into the circle. Now, if I, can get, if I get you in the circle then what you realize is that you are in a high position. The Father must think a lot of you because He pulled you into the inner circle. Okay? You don't get there because you've qualified by Bible reading or you have gave enough to the church or you've been saved long enough. We have a hierarchical system in the church that is so bizarre where we really feel like, you know, you're close to God when you get saved, but you sort of got to earn your stripes in being able to hear from God and then be used of God. So who do you think you are? You've only been here a year. That's kind of the way it works in a lot of places. Who do you think you are? You've only been in the church a year. This guy's been in the church 20 years. We, we should trust more what he says. And while I do have respect for, for elders and whomever to whom respect is due, I don't believe that God's spiritual program is a hierarchical system by which he's got a clock in the heavens and he says, they've been saved long enough, they qualify. Because you don't, there's no such thing as earning this through works or performance. It is all a grace gift. So what I want you to do today is I want you to ignore how long you've been saved. Okay, I want you to ignore when you came into the church. None of those things make any difference in the grace of God anyhow. Or how you got saved, you cried and knelt down at an altar and the other guy didn't cry at all. He just smiled and said yes to Jesus. And, and yes to Jesus was the key, not the emotional response. So I want you to ignore all of that and I want you to put yourself in the middle of the circle. Because that's where Paul placed you. Purchased by God. Grace of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from iniquity. Grace of Jesus Christ has purified you. Paul said you're in God, which right there. Now put yourself there. If that's God's inner circle, who else is in that circle? And it's not, it's not about your neighbor, okay? Yeah, your neighbor's in it. If they're purchased, they're in that circle too. But who else in the heavenlies? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all dwell there, right? The Son is at the right hand of the Father. He has given you the identity of the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is not some inferior member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit who's just some influence. One of the tragedies of the modern church is that the Holy Spirit has become... Uh, to the two I's, letter I. He's become an influence and he's become inferior. And I think that's a tragedy. Most Christians look at the Holy Spirit as an influence. He's the, little, he's the good angel. There's the devil. Remember this silliness? We actually learned this from American television. Yeah, we did. You got a little devil over here and you got a little angel over here. He's basically the Holy Spirit. And then the little devil's telling you what to do and you know you shouldn't. And then the little angel's telling you what to do and you know you should. And you notice they always want to do what the little devil tells them to do. You know, the little devil's fun, the little angel's boring. And we've made the Holy Spirit an influencer. He stands outside of us influencing our decisions. Wrong. That's a tragedy. The Holy Spirit is not out of, outside of you influencing you. The Holy Spirit is in you. You are, in the eyes of God, a spirit being. When He sees you, He sees the Holy Spirit. He's not an influence. He's your life. He's also not the other eye, inferior. The Father's big. Jesus is right there with Him, sitting at His right hand. And the Holy Ghost is sort of the, you know, He runs around doing the bidding of the Father and the Son. That he, the Father tells him where to go today. And the, and, and the Holy Spirit, that pretty much puts him on the same par as the devil. 
They're both just running around. One seeks whom he may devour. The other one seeks whom he may lead. No. The Holy Spirit is not an inferior member. When you're in God and God is in you and you're in that circle, it's all right there. So if God is in love with Jesus and He's in love with the Holy Spirit, He is equally in love with you. For those of you who will believe that, something spectacular belongs to you. Watch this text. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. I go to the New King James. Still not totally satisfied with it because if you'll look in your hard copy, you'll notice some italicized words, and that means they were added by your translators. I'm going to read the, them with the italicized words there, and then we're going to look at it in the Greek. Therefore, to you who believe. How many of you believe? Okay, we're all together then. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Huh. Just the very sound of it is pretty good. To you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. In case I don't come back to the end of the verse, let me deal with this real fast. It's obvious we've got a quote at the end of the verse that quotes from the Old Testament. That's what your New Testament writers were using as their foundation for their sermons. They use an Old Testament scripture, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. They're talking about Jesus was rejected by his own people. He becomes the chief cornerstone of a new faith called Christianity upon which we don't place our faith in that system anymore. We place our faith in, in the rock who becomes a cornerstone of a brand new building. You are not built on Judaism. This is a lie that the church has bought hook, line, and sinker, is that you are built on Judaism. You are not. You are built on the rock, and his name is Jesus. And they go, well, yeah, but Jesus was a Jew. Jesus lived in the Middle East as well. Jesus, uh, Jesus probably had a beard. Uh, Jesus wore sandals. No, you're not built on any of those things. You're not built on, you're, you're built on he who was rejected. Why was he rejected? He was replacing everything they had. If you take him, you don't need a priest. If you take him, you don't need a temple. If you take him, you don't need to kill a lamb. If you, are you catching my drift? You know why he was rejected? Because if you take him, they're out of a job. You're not built on Judaism. You're built on Christ. Jesus is the stone which was rejected. So, and, and it's not about obedience. We're so deceived by the translation that says, to the disobedient. You're, it's, this is not about obedience versus disobedience. The phrase disobedient is a mistranslation because it's the opposite of believe. Notice the, the fifth word. Therefore, to you who believe in the Greek, you just put a prefix on it that flips believe. What's the opposite of believe? <laughs> Unbelief. Not disobedient. The translators took believe, took the opposite, and went, well, that means disobey. I'm not mad about it because the reality is New Testament disobedience is unbelief. I didn't get a whole lot of response on that, so I'll just try to throw it out there one, only one more time. <laughs> New Testament disobedience is not what you go around not doing that you should or you do what you shouldn't do. New Testament disobedience is not believing that he has finished the work. And that's God saying, you're being disobedient. I've already told you I've finished the work. Why are you trying to finish the work? A lot of our disobedience is masked by just good Christianity. Well, I'm just doing the right thing. No, you're being disobedient. Well, how do you say that? Because you don't believe he finished the work. You believe you have to finish the work. So what's the opposite of belief? Unbelief. So what's disobedience in the New Testament? Unbelief. So a, another spot where, because they took it and put it into a word that now means something totally different, we miss this. But to reject the stone, which is Christ, is fundamental to New Testament disobedience. It's just unbelief. Okay? Now, we lose, we lost the screen. Oh, okay. I want to, I want to, I want to take that passage and I want to show you the, get your hard copy because I don't really want to see it. Yeah, you got it? Okay. Two, seven. All right. Therefore, to you who believe he's precious, but to those who are disobedient, and it's back. 
Is it going to stay there? Or we're going to try this. The screen doesn't see me lay my Bible down. To you who believe, he is precious. There's some italicized stuff there. I want to show you the Greek rendering, okay? Look at this next one. Unto you who believe is the preciousness. It's not just he is the preciousness. Why? Because you're in the circle with him. When you believed, he brought you into the inner circle. Okay? We already saw that. Now, if you're in the inner circle, for those who believe, it's not just that he is the preciousness. Anybody in is the preciousness. Where are you? In. What are you? Preciousness. So to, ac to accent the preciousness of Jesus cannot be properly done by dissing you. Okay? To accent the preciousness of Jesus can only be done by placing you in there with Him by which you both come out as precious. Because Jesus does not hold a higher place in the Father than you do. Hard for us to swallow. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, the Father doesn't say, I like Jeff, but I love Jesus. Wrong. The Father sees Jeff and says, man, I love my kids. Yes. Jeff and Jesus. Yes. Jesus in him. How do you know this, Pastor? Paul said that's the mystery that was shut up from the ages but has now been revealed in the last days, which is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. Amen. You have that? There you go. Now, the preciousness that we see there is so rare in the English, and I wish it wasn't so rare because it shouldn't be. Almost every time in the New Testament you see the word honor, it's the same Greek word that they used here for preciousness. So I kind of wish just every now and then throughout the New Testament, they'd swapped it up a little bit. Because we look at honor as respect, but that's not the Greek. Honor there is the same as precious. And what do you think of when you think of precious? You don't think of respect. You, you think of something beautiful, rare, high value. All that's good. In fact, did you know another word that gets used in the English for the Greek word for precious is price? You want to know where it was used? This is an odd one, but you have to use it even in negative connotations if it's the right Greek word. And the price they set on his head was 30 pieces of silver. The Greek word for price, preciousness. Precious, what? That seems negative. Well, the, the fact that it's the value that they set, it may be a low value to us, but they use the phrase, the value that they set on his head. So precious is value. If, if Christ is your preciousness, Christ is your value. You see that? If you are precious with Jesus, you are valuable to the Father. Did you know that the man that went out into the field and found the pearl of great price and went and sold everything he had to buy the pearl? That is not you finding Jesus in a field and selling everything you have to serve Jesus. That is the Father finding you in a field and selling everything he has to buy you. Did you know that? A lot of people preach that backwards and say, I'm going to introduce you to the pearl of great price today. Come up here and give him everything you have so you can buy him. That's opposite to the new covenant. He gave everything he had to buy you because when he saw you laying there, he went, wow, that is worth everything I got. I'm going to give everything I got away so I can own that. And when I get him, I'm not going to leave him as an outlier. I'm going to put him in the center. He's going to be an inner circle. And if he'll ever wake up to that reality, he'll realize how precious he is. Yes. How beautiful. Isn't that good? Let's take just one of those honors. We could take a bunch of them. Let's just take one of them and let's just replace it with precious, okay? 
Look at this. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus. Who do we see? Jesus. Put him in the middle, okay? We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. The word right there for honor is the same word in Peter for precious. Crowned with glory and preciousness. I just like the way it sounds. It means a little more to me even than honor. Because in some ways, we honor for, in us in America, the highest honor is to die for your country. Okay? Praise God. Thank God for those who have paid what we call the ultimate price. Right? I'm not trying to be political, but I just say thank God because we live in a country where people paid the ultimate price. That's high honor. We give the highest of honor in our nation to that. That's foreign to the Greek. It doesn't mean we're wrong. It just, that's our definition. Honor here is preciousness. It's so valuable. They crown, God crowned Jesus with glory and preciousness that He, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone or that He might pay the ultimate price for all of us. Somebody has already died for you. God's not asking you to die for him. He's asking you to live. Jesus said, I have come that they might have, not I have come that they might die and die sacrificially. In fact, when Paul wanted to call you a sacrifice, he said, you are a living sacrifice. You are someone who gives themselves sacrificially while they're alive who does not feel like their greatest gift they can give God is to die for Him, but to live for Him. It's a living sacrifice. Let me give you one more. And I just want to, I want to bring this one into your home practically as we head you to your vehicles. Okay? Look at this one. 1 Peter 3.7, this is one chapter away from our precious verse. Husbands, likewise dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. We take 1 Peter 3, 7 and we get all up in the air about it in a culture like ours in America because we, we see the phrase as the weaker vessel and some people get all upset. But please put it in the context of where it was written. And it's not written as a social commentary. It was written as a spiritual reality comparing God's people to Adam and Eve. And so, did you know the whole marriage issue in the New Testament is not God telling you how your marriage is. It's God telling you how your marriage is with Him. It's not your marriage with each other. Although your marriage with each other should be a reflection of your marriage with Him, the closer your earthly marriage reflects your heavenly marriage, the happier your earthly marriage will be. The further it is from your heavenly marriage, the more it will be like the world. And how's that working out? Okay, And so there's a distinct difference. The authors didn't write to teach you how to make your marriage better. They wrote to teach you about your heavenly marriage and knowing that would improve your marriage. So you are the weaker vessel in the marriage with God because you're always the female in the marriage. He's the husband. We're the bride. Right? If we're the bride, we're the female in the marriage. That's not meant to be a gender thing. It's just meant to state a spirit fact about our wedding. We together. Walking through this slowly. I want to get this right. I want to make sure we all get it. We're the, we're, we're the, we're, we are in the marriage the weaker vessel. Well, we don't have a problem with that. We have a problem with it when it comes to societal. But we don't have a problem when it gets spiritual. So take it spiritual. That's what it was written to be. So as the weaker vessel, it's not saying women are weak. But as the weaker vessel in the marriage, based upon the Adam and Eve relationship, which is really a reflection of the father and the bride relationship, the husband and the bride relationship, give honor as a weaker vessel, being heirs together the grace of life. Honor. Same word. Precious. How does the father look at you? Precious. Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife. So take it into the relationship. Take it into, because he did talk to real people. Here, husbands, take it into real marriages. Husbands, if you would view your wife as precious, you would be 
heirs together of the grace of life. I think it's one of the more underpreached verses in the grace move, uh, community. I hate movement. The grace community, we're not talking a lot about the grace of life, which is an accessible grace in the marriage covenant where two people are not in a social contract anymore. They are living life in and through and with one another, discovering the beauty of life through the marriage covenant and actually tasting something about life that cannot be achieved on your own. See that? Now I've got some married people sitting here nodding their head yes. They have seen this. They have seen that as they honor one another as the preciousness of God, they experience the grace of God in a way they never could have had on their own. Just no way they could have ever tasted that kind of grace living on their own. I've got other marriages who are looking at me with a blank slate. They're going, this is new ground, Pastor. <laughs> I don't feel that in my heart. And so the, the issue then is how we honor one another, how we view one another as precious. Because you need to know how the Father views you. And that is as precious. And the more we do that to one another, the more we experience the grace of life. And I believe you can grow in a place in your marriage to where you don't understand life without the other half of your covenant. You don't comprehend life without the other half of your covenant, right? To where you, you would have to relearn that. And, so, and thank God we have a husband who loves us who teaches us the other half of that grace so that even if we're not married or we've lost a spouse or wherever we're at, he is to us, as he said, I will be a husband spiritually and begins to, to do that in our lives. Now, I did all this because I wanted you to see the preciousness that you have, but I titled it the preciousness of Jesus. Why didn't we title it the preciousness of you? Well, because the moment that you really realize the preciousness of Jesus, by default... You recognize the preciousness of your own self. Because you're not outside of the circle, you're in the circle. Find the preciousness in life this week. Find the preciousness in your spouse. Find the preciousness in your children. Find the preciousness in your work, in your school. Find the place where God's grace is in action. Just like we said in the music today about the wonders of your mercy. Never lose that wonder. It's the same with God's grace. Never just feel this is a passive thing. We hear about it at church. This is involved in your everyday life is the grace of God. It's not just a doctrine. It's not even just a doctrine I go to church and hear, boy, isn't that good. No, it is a day-to-day -day walk. What am I equipping you to do? I'm equipping you to have this on your own all the time. You have the knowledge that you're the preciousness. And I thank God for it. Amen. Aren't you glad for that knowledge? Amen. Now we could just talk and talk and talk and have a good time, but I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, let them go. <laughs> You've sufficiently worn them out. They can only sit on that pew so long. So I'm going to honor the Holy Spirit and honor your time. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray the Holy Spirit use this word to dig down deep. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? And I'm not one to play on your emotions and I'm not one to try to get you to do something for me or get you to do something for God. I believe the Word is so powerful, all He's asking you to do is meet Him with faith. So I'm trusting that you have heard the Word today. The Word works. The Word works. If you've heard the Word, don't worry about you working. Oh man, I'm not going to remember all that. Don't panic. You don't have to remember all that. Some of you even need to quit taking so many notes. You're writing so much that you're not even hearing. Just let the Word work. It'll soak down into your heart. It'll grab hold of the nutrients of your spirit, and it will grow. The Word will do the work. Jesus said they cast the seed inside of the seeds, the DNA of the kingdom. A big old tree grows out of a little bitty mustard seed. The point Jesus was making is the seed just falls. You don't, you don't stress out. Father, the Word has dropped into open hearts today. I believe, Father, you gave us this word so Jesus would look good 
and so that your children would look good. Not so that we would see him and feel like dogs because he's so good and we're so bad. Father, that is killing us. And thank you that your word releases us from that silliness. Thank you that we're released from the condemnation. He's good, we're bad. Thank you, Father. Now, for, and, and Father, there may be an unbeliever in our midst and there may be an unbeliever watching, but I don't think they can hear your word very long, keep hearing it, and stay an unbeliever. So, Father, I pray for anybody who's in this room or watching around the world that, come to that comes to this moment as an unbeliever, that, Father, they stop being an unbeliever. You can't make them, but I believe the word's so powerful that they have to make a decision in their heart. I don't believe that because I think it's so easy to believe. I think it's harder for them to not believe. So, Father, for anybody waffling right now on that precipice, do I believe this? I just pray your spirit shower them with love. And I just pray you pour into them, Father, the affection and the preciousness and the love of the finished work and show them the resurrection power of simply believing on Jesus. And for those who will believe on you, start of a brand new walk happens right now. For those who already believe on you, and Father, they've heard this word, help them to be stress-free. They don't have to remember every verse. They don't have to remember the Greek. They don't have to remember the next reference. They don't have to remember the little quip. Just let the word work. It is powerful, and I believe if we'll just meet it with faith, it'll do its job. Thank you for the word you've given us today. Thank you for buying us out of iniquity. Thank you for purifying us, you doing the work. Thank you for putting us in the inner circle of God's love and affection and for making us the preciousness in the eyes of God. We praise you and we thank you for that. And we receive this word today as a fresh word for our souls. We receive it for a word for our marriages. We receive it as a word for our day-to-day -day lives. In Jesus' name, and if it's yours, say amen. For more information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.